Obesity, particularly abdominal obesity and the associated cardiometabolic complications, are critical areas of investigation. The endocannabinoid system helps to regulate the central control of energy balance and peripheral metabolic processes, both of which may contribute to cardiometabolic risk factors. The endocannabinoid system, or ECS, influences multiple physiologic processes. This intricate system modulates energy intake, as well as nutrient transport, metabolism and storage. The ECS regulates these processes through endogenous ligands, such as anandamide and 2-arachidonyl glycerol, and the CB1 receptor. CB1 receptors are located in the brain, digestive tract, muscle and adipose tissue. Integration of these central and peripheral ECS components is achieved through neuronal and hormonal signaling. Within the brain, CB1 receptors are among the most abundant G-protein coupled receptors. However, in contrast to classical signaling, where information travels from pre to post synaptic neurons, the ECS uses retrograde signaling. The information travels from post to presynaptic neuron. Let's take a closer look at this mechanism using a glutamatergic neuron model. When an action potential reaches the axon terminal, membrane depolarization triggers the release of glutamate. Glutamate binds to postsynaptic glutamate receptors, inducing calcium channels to open. During periods of intense neural activity, calcium accumulates in the postsynaptic neuron. This calcium buildup causes the synthesis and release of endocannabinoids from membrane lipids. Diffusing across the synaptic cleft, the endocannabinoids bind to the CB1 receptor, activating the G proteins. Activation influences ion flow. The result, suppression of presynaptic neurotransmitter release. Endocannabinoids are subsequently taken back into the cell and enzymatically degraded. In addition to acting as neural messengers, endocannabinoids mediate paracrine and autocrine signaling in adipocytes, hepatocytes, and other cells. endocannabinoid system activity in the central nervous system regulates food intake. For example, ECS stimulation by hunger and fasting signals stimulates appetite and increases the palatability of food. Endocannabinoids slow gastric emptying and GI transit and appear to stimulate secretion of ghrelin, a neuropeptide that increases appetite and food intake. After eating, Cholecystokinin in the duodenum triggers satiety signals. Subsequently, ECS activity is decreased through suppression of CB1 expression. An increase in the adiposity hormone leptin decreases endocannabinoid levels in the hypothalamus and decreases food intake. ECS regulation of peripheral metabolism influences energy balance. Stimulation of the ECS increases food intake and adiposity. Conversely, blocking CB1 receptors reduces food intake and adiposity. In the liver, ECS stimulation can lead to lipogenesis through the activation of hepatic lipogenic enzymes and increased fatty acid synthesis. Chronic stimulation of the ECS is associated with dyslipidemia. Activation of CB1 receptors increases expression of SREBP1C, a lipogenic transcription factor, and increases fatty acid synthesis. SREBP1C increases production of lipogenic enzymes, ACC1, and fatty acid synthase. Increased fatty acid synthesis can lead to production of large triglyceride-rich VLDL. Large triglyceride-rich VLDL sets the stage for the atherogenic lipid profile of small, dense LDL, decreased levels of atheroprotective HDL, and overall increases in cholesterol and triglyceride levels. 
Adiponectin, another hormone secreted by adipocytes, regulates lipid and glucose metabolism. Adiponectin is believed to regulate fatty acid oxidation in muscle and liver, thus improving insulin sensitivity. CB1 receptor stimulation in adipocytes reduces adiponectin, while CB1 blockade increases adiponectin synthesis. Metabolic dysregulation leads to a constellation of symptoms including abdominal obesity, atherogenic dyslipidemia, hypertension, insulin resistance, prothrombotic state, and pro-inflammatory state. As basic and clinical research progresses, we will continue to increase our understanding of the central and peripheral endocannabinoid system and its role in the regulation of metabolic function. In the normal transmission of pain, ascending nociceptive signals travel up the spinal thalamic pathway to the thalamus, where they are processed and relayed to cortical and other areas. The ascending pathway also relays to the periaqueductal gray matter an important part of the descending pain modulating system where specific cannabinoid receptors are located. Stimulation of the periaqueductal gray is known to produce an analgesic effect. However, this neuroregulatory process is thought to be tonically restricted by inhibitory GABAergic off cells. Ascending pain signals relayed through the periaqueductal gray suppress the activity of GABAergic off-cells through cannabinoid modulation, thereby increasing activity in the descending pain modulation pathway and increasing the analgesic effect. This is called depolarization-induced suppression of inhibition. A synaptic feedback mechanism is believed to be an inherent part of our normal neuroregulatory processes, including descending pain modulation. In many regions of the CNS, including the periaqueductal gray, the generation of postsynaptic action potentials is modified by an endogenous cannabinoid regulatory system. Endogenous cannabinoids are synthesized on demand from the phospholipid bilayer of the postsynaptic membrane. These lipophilic ligands are released directly into the synaptic cleft and act in retrograde fashion on the presynaptic neuron where the cannabinoid receptors are expressed. Binding of the endogenous cannabinoids affects intracellular signal transduction pathways, reducing the influx of calcium ions into the presynaptic neuron, causing a decrease in further neurotransmitter release. This in turn influences the frequency of postsynaptic firing. The administration of exogenous cannabinoids orally or through inhalation may therefore provide an option for treating pain that has responded poorly to conventional pain therapy. When exogenous cannabinoids are administered orally, they travel via the GI tract to the liver where they are metabolized before entering the bloodstream and then the CNS. The onset of action from oral administration is less rapid compared to the inhaled route. When exogenous cannabinoids are inhaled, they travel through the respiratory tract to the alveoli of the lung where they diffuse rapidly into the circulatory system. They then travel through the bloodstream towards the CNS where they diffuse across the blood-brain barrier and into the surrounding tissues of the brain and spinal cord. Exogenous cannabinoids exert their modulatory effects upon the abundant cannabinoid receptors distributed throughout the CNS. The effects of cannabinoids may be illustrated by comparing three neuronal synapses showing normal pain transmission, the influence of endogenous cannabinoids, and the influence of exogenous cannabinoid administration. Exogenous cannabinoids from the bloodstream 
bind to cannabinoid receptors on the presynaptic neuron and mimic the endogenous synaptic modulatory effect by decreasing influx of calcium ions. In this way, pain and other neural processes are modulated. The clinical effects of exogenous cannabinoid administration are not limited to pain and have proven effects including the reduction of anxiety, spasticity, anorexia, and nausea. The development of novel drugs to modulate endogenous cannabinoid reuptake and metabolism may also prove beneficial in pain therapy. The therapeutic benefits of cannabinoids, including modification of the endogenous cannabinoid signaling system, should be further explored through clinical research. Until uh, quite recently, actually, until the mid-60s, the active constituent was not known. We identified a compound, tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, which is the only one that causes these uh, changes. For many years, it was unknown whether these changes uh, are just a non-specific action of, of THC, but in the mid-80s, it was found that there is a receptor in the brain that uh, is acted upon by THC and starts a cascade of reactions which causes the changes that we identify as high. But how come that the brain has a receptor for a plant constituent? After all, uh, the, our brain doesn't have a receptor for every plant constituent, actually doesn't have a receptor for any plant constituent. So we started working on the assumption that maybe there are compounds in the brain that act on this particular receptor, and THC in the plant actually mimics the action of the compounds in the brain. Indeed, about 10, 15 years ago, we were uh, able to isolate two compounds. One we called anandamide, and the other is known as 2-AG, that stimulate, that bind to this particular receptor, and they start a cascade of reactions that we identify as high. Why do we have that system of receptor, endogenous cannabinoids? Why? I mean, just in order to cause high? No. This is a very important physiological system, which is involved in a large number of uh, physiological reactions and in large number of therapeutic reactions. For example, anandamide and 2-AG are involved in neuroprotection. When we have a brain trauma, for example, the brain tries to reduce the damage by overproducing, if you wish, these compounds which lower the damage. Uh, they are also involved in anxiety. It is involved in sleep. It is involved in essentially all physiological reactions that have been investigated. Chances are that this particular system will uh, be the basis on which uh, a large number of drugs will be developed. At the moment, there is one major drug that has been introduced in Europe. A company produced an antagonist to the cannabinoid system, and they use it in order to reduce the appetite and also to enhance metabolism of fats so that ultimately we see an effect on obesity, an effect on all these diseases that are associated with obesity. Many other companies are working on many different aspects of uh, cannabinoids, for example, inflammation, uh, neurological diseases, maybe Alzheimer, and I assume that within the next 10 years we shall have a whole array of new drugs as many companies are at present working on all these aspects.